Hey, hello and welcome. Wow, my face was really big there. Sorry, I was up close to my camera. My name is Scott Abel and you are watching The Content Advantage, a talk show about content with a uh, special guest today, Kim Jeske. Uh, this show is designed for content people who uh, are interested in content topics. And today we're going to be talking about product content uh, and product content strategy more specifically with uh, Kim. Kim, thanks for joining us on the show today. Thanks, Scott. Glad to be here. Excellent. Let me tell the audience a few things about today's show. First of all, on this webinar platform, we can't um, see or hear you. We don't have access to your camera or microphone, so you don't have any worries there. Also, at any time during the show, if you'd like to ask a question of our guest or myself, you can do so by clicking the Ask a Question tab located underneath your webinar, webinar viewing panel. Clicking that button will open a little window into which you can type a question and click Submit and send it over to us. Just know we can't text you back an answer. It's just a one-way communication channel for questions. Also, during the show, you can access additional content from the attachment section of your webinar viewing panel. Doing so will open a document repository where you can find links to additional content, including troubleshooting in case you're having any audio or video challenges with the Bright Talk platform. There's also information about our presenter and information from the sponsor of the show today, along with some, um, occasionally there's some articles and other things there. So definitely check out the attachment section during the show. During the webinar, you will not actually be asked about uh, any polling questions this time, so you don't have to worry about that. At the end of the show, I will ask you to leave a rating and provide some feedback for Kim. And uh, the rating system is a one through five star rating system with five being a high or excellent rating. And we'd love for, to know what you thought about the show. And I know that uh, our guest loves to hear constructive feedback, so feel free to share at the end of the show. All right, without further ado, let's welcome to the digital stage. Our guest today, Kim Jeske. Kim, hey, welcome. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great. It's fun to be here and talk about uh, management and technical content and, and my career path here. Awesome. Well, then let's start off by diving right in and just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for a living and, and how are you connected to today's topic? Sure. Um, so I am currently the uh, director of product content at Cloudflare. Uh, I came uh, to this through, uh, I was a tech writer for several years. Uh, I was a product owner uh, for an e-commerce uh, website. And uh, throughout that, I began managing uh, people, smaller teams and, and things like that. Um, so all of those experiences kind of came together into what I'm doing today, which is, is leading a, uh, a team of content creators. Uh, where we focus mostly on uh, technical content or that uh, post-sales customer journey. Excellent. And you know, that is at the heart of everything that I talk about. In fact, I'm sure there are several people in my life who would wish that we would not talk about this so much. <laughs> <laughs> the product content is everywhere around us. And I think what you have discovered is that there's a business value to this. Tell us a little bit about um, the product strategy job. And, and also, um, I heard that you got a promotion. So you can also mention a little bit about that. Yeah, I was recently promoted to senior director. Um, so I've been at, thank you, at Cloudflare for about two years. So it was, uh, it was really nice to have that recognition uh, that what we're doing uh, is, is working, that we're making the impact that we want to with, with content. Um, so for us at, at Cloudflare, um, technical content, it's, it's what technical content is at, at most companies. It, it explains what and how uh, to use uh, a product. And for us, we focus on developer documentation. Uh, we have support KBs. We actually focus on in-product content. So content design uh, is, is part of our uh, customer journey, the content customer journey that falls under my umbrella. And then we do some of the other content that, that comes from the product as well. So think like emails, uh, if it's coming from uh, the uh, from the product, because maybe you're hitting a limit with the internet or something like that, one of the, the settings that you've uh, set with our Cloudflare product. Excellent. And does that include things like um, error messages and on-screen information that should or, you know, hopefully be useful <laughs> to yes. people when they're using Cloudflare? <laughs> It totally does. Uh, and that's, I think, falls into the technical content part because it's it's a little different how we're set up uh, yeah. because we have all of the content under one team instead of having like a UX team and then a content team, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and we're really following the content customer journey. And do, so, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. It's the, the error messages that we're focusing on. Do you feel that unification is um, not only necessary, but something that previous companies you've worked at maybe um, 
we're also trying to learn about but haven't mastered because it seems like once somebody crosses the line and they start doing it fairly well, their imagination starts kicking off of other ways they could use the discipline that it takes to create a, you know, repurposable structured content that's not coming from 15 different silos, right? Yeah, I think the, the, the word you said right there, silo, I think it's trying to figure out how do you break down those silos. And um, I don't know if we've got it figured out uh, yeah. all the way yet, but um, by thinking about the content customer journey, it feels like we've got a good handshake when you're thinking about the ideation with a product and doing that feature work and, and thinking about um, how, how you want a customer to flow through um, a feature uh, and it's, it's connecting to the technical content. So ideally, the UI is perfect. You don't need content. Everyone is just really successful and doesn't need to go find that additional support content. Um, but it's not always the case for, for many different reasons. And, and I think what we're seeing is, is we have a, a good connection between that ideation and then when you're going to need support or help or you're going to be looking for developer documentation. Tell me what you mean when you say ideation. What does the, what does the content person do when they're ideating? So they're probably working with the design team um, and a product manager, um, ideally. Uh, that, that trifecta seems to be the, the folks who can uh, come up with the, the great ideas for, for new features and products. And, and that's what we're really trying to, um, what, what I would love to see as, is that we have that as part of our process. Now, we're very early stages with some of this, mm -hmm. uh, but ideally, I think that's, that's when we really see the magic happen. Could you give like a high level for, we usually get a lot of questions about this. So I'm going to go head, uh, head off our questioners at the pass, sure. so to speak. <laughs> so um, tell us just a little bit about the makeup of your team. How many people are, are involved? Are they remote? What, what are they doing kind of thing? And, um, and who are you in charge of? Sure. Um, so the majority of my team is remote, uh, interesting enough. Uh, so when I started, it was just me and one or two other people. Uh, so this was something that we've really built from the ground up and uh, all pretty much during the pandemic as well. Uh, so the entire team, uh, for the most part, has uh, joined over the last couple of years. And we have technical writers, uh, we have content designers, uh, got project manager slash scrum master. And then we have managers um, and the technical writers focus on the like support KBs and uh, developer docs. And uh, just this year, we've been able to, to um, establish content designers as content designers. So they're not doing technical writing plus content design. Um, and that was a, a goal that I had set for last year when, um, when we were growing and, and uh, the, the company was like, this is something we really want to see and do. Excellent. Well, that puts you in a really nice opportunity to um, do the things that you wanted to do that you knew that were probably the best way to tackle some of those problems. I think sometimes when the opportunities are not there, like let's say we're in a time of crisis and the company's not doing as great, it's really challenging to get people to want to change and to pay for that change and to invest in it. But I think you were very fortunate. And um, I think that's what you're saying because of where your company was in the growth period that they recognize that to scale, they have to do all these things. Yeah. Um, I think I've, I've been in a fortunate place where as we've found these gaps, I've been able to talk to my leadership and bring these topics up. And um, a lot of that comes from, we're just seeing a lot of requests. And if we're getting a lot of ticket requests to look at in product content, and my team is just a team of technical writers, it's probably not, the right skill set, we need to bring in a new skill set. And, and that's really what led to um, bringing the content design team together. I also had a technical writer who wanted to become a content designer. So she and I talked quite a bit last year about how do we make this happen um, and what would the benefit be and the value. So um, from within the team itself, uh, when we find gaps and it uh, seems like it, it's something that we want to do, uh, the, the team comes and talks to me and, and then we figure out how to fix that. So is 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 that opportunity something that um, is part of your responsibility to kind of help people find their place um, in the organization itself? Because obviously you want people that are well-rounded and the more that they know about the Cloudflare, how it works and how the content experience is designed, the more the more useful it seems like they'd be to the company. Absolutely. Um, that That is definitely part of my role. Uh, it's It's part of, I think, the way I approach it is thinking about career development. So if you join Cloudflare and, and you're working on technical writing and you're really enjoying it, but your heart is with strategy or uh, content design, maybe that's that's 
where you seem to gravitate towards, then uh, I think we have the opportunity to figure out how to make that happen. At least we've done that in the past. And um, it, it makes it so that folks enjoy their careers and, and can move into what, what they like doing during the day. So, and, and it's happened to managers too. I've had uh, folks who um, really had an aptitude for leading and, and being managers, and we've been able to support that as well. Excellent. One of our viewers wants to know a, a question about technical content being thought of as a post-sale content asset, meaning that it's provided to those who need it only after they purchase a product, which, you know, seems to have been the history for technical communication. But that seems to be changing, and I've been arguing this for a while now. What factors do you see that are changing the way organizations view technical content, and how do we know it's useful to those seeking to purchase products? Yeah. Scott, if you asked me this question five years ago, I would have been like, nope, it's post sales. It's it's all in the uh, late later stages of the customer journey. And I think that's just because as a technical writer, um, I was working on packaged uh, hardware and driver software. So when you're actually receiving it, it's because you've you've bought it and you're using it um, as a as a SaaS company. Um, our content is out there. It's it's readily available. And so folks, when they are doing research to find out, do they want a Cloudflare product? Um, or if they are already a customer or user and they're, they're looking to see if there's other features or products available to them, um, they're, they're ending up in uh, developer documentation. Part of that is we have great SEO. Uh, we do spend some time making sure that uh, we have good SEO and that we're, we're having the right keywords and, and headings so that folks can find what we're creating. Because honestly, if we're creating content and no one can read it, like who cares, right? So we want to make sure that folks can actually find what we're writing. And then um, I th like as, as we're thinking about, is this impactful? A year ago, I think we had less than 500,000 views to developer documentation. And I looked at what our visitors were last month. And we're we're a little below three million views. So I think I think we're creating the right stuff. Folks are folks are finding wow. it and using it. Yeah, we've had a lot of success. It's very very exciting. Uh, that that you know I think that those numbers those kind of things are are really revealing, and they give you the aha moment. How did you feel when you started to realize like well well yeah maybe some of this is kind of impacting how people view our brand. It's marketing right? Like I I, I wonder myself when I complain, because I like to go on LinkedIn and say, hey, hey, today I tried to use this app and look at the error message here and look at what happened when I did what they asked and see how these two don't go together. And then I complain about it. And then, you know, some people are like, I don't understand. And I said, to me, it's it teaches people that, look, this is incongruent. This is a problem. But it also tells the brand, I had to call your support center because on one page it says this and then in your app it says that. And because I don't I can't decide if this is the same thing as that, then I have to call you. And I, I you know, to, to me, it's a management problem that maybe a middle manager can't immediately solve, but it should be escalated higher. So I I intentionally tag brands when I'm complaining about their stuff, hoping that there's some customer satisfaction person somewhere who said, wait a minute. <laughs> We're getting calls about this. I mean, uh, you know, have you had some aha moments by looking at the data? Is that where you kind of said, okay, look, clearly the numbers went right up when we started focusing on SEO? I think where I'm seeing it and where I struggle, actually. So this is this is where I, my, my background's in technical content. So I want sometimes to keep the technical content uh, without the marketing content. Yeah. But when folks are actually looking for um, if there's a certain feature that's available to them, it might actually be that they're looking because they have a specific plan already. And plan information to me is, has been traditionally like a market marketing information uh, type of content. Yeah. However, we get asked a lot, can you put plan information in developer docs? And I was very resistant uh, to begin with, but then we started seeing from search results, people do look for this information. So then I think the next step is, okay, if we add this, how do we make sure that we're, we're keeping the spirit of developer documentation so that we are um, helping the user, making sure that the user is successful with the, the content and not feeling like I'm, I'm trying to sell them. However, if it is an upgrade, it is something that maybe you have to pay for, pay more for, 
I probably should figure out how to provide that path. Um, and I learned that in, in marketing, like you, you try not to have those dead end pages, uh, but how do you do that without making it feel like you're trying to sell something through developer docs? Cause that's, that's not a great experience. Right. We don't want right. that at all. Right. Yeah. And how do you do it if you're increasingly trying to modularize your content and keep yeah. every topic as one thing. So the writer wants to say, yes, yes, but if you do this and it's like, yes, but they haven't done that yet. So that's right. another topic. And yet, and then we're trying to break that paradigm. Um, I was on a website the other day where I was trying to find the solution to a problem. And I used the chat at first. It, you know, it was as useful as they programmed it to be. It's not, it wasn't able to solve my problem because it could think. It couldn't, yeah. it, it could only reference things. So eventually I got to a support person and she said, I'm not in sales. So right there, she went out of her way to tell me something about marketing. She said, but it seems like the thing that you're calling about is, be, is, is um, an issue in the version of the software that you're using. And did you know that your license allows you to go in and upgrade this particular thing to the new thing? And you've got like the whole year to do it. And then you get this new feature and I don't have to teach you how to, you know, kind of work around it over here. Instead, you could just upgrade. And I said, it would be great if, you know, the questions were tied to the upgrade. And she said, right. oh, that's another department. <laughs> So even the support person knew that that was a great idea to marry those kinds of information. And she was marrying them on the phone with me verbally, but it wasn't part of their process. This was, she decided this would help Scott more. And she said, you know, is there any reason your company doesn't want to upgrade? Sometimes they people want to stay on a certain version of our product and they don't want to change. So that's why we don't automatically update them with these particular features. So what, what have you learned about technical product content and and why do you think because you've said some things that are pretty interesting in the past that technical content is a product and then how did you explain that to people who are product people and content people so first it's it's not a project right so right. technical content as a product is like at, at the heart we're not treating content like a project um developer docs is open source it's in github it's constantly iterating. Um, Cloudflare ships fast. So we are always adding content like daily adding content. So we had to find a way to be able to meet the needs of the actual product. And to, to do that, it means like coming up with uh, like brass tacks. How are you actually going to get this done? And then uh, what's the strategy that you apply? So um, my product owner days, uh, that, that skill set that I picked up uh, on, my, on my way to this job, um, I became a, a big advocate for agile methodologies. So that's something that we've uh, kind of embraced. Um, agile is meant to work for the team. So we don't follow agile in the way that Agilistas would probably suggest, but that's OK. Yeah. Um, we do have sprints and, and things like that. So it also provides a lot of uh, transparency to the organization about what we can do within a, a two-week sprint or, or if we're planning out what, what we can accomplish. And that's really exciting because it gives us boundaries to be able to say, this is what we can do. This is what you can expect from us. And um, I think it gives the, the team some breathing room. So that's half of it. The other half, though, is yeah. is really strategies from product management, um, and mm. and it helps that I sit in product. Um, so the the team around me speaks this language as well. And you're thinking about: Am I creating the right content for users? Um, sure. Am I testing it? Is it in the right place? Does it belong in the product? Does it belong in dev docs? Does it belong someplace else? So that's really what I mean when I say we treat content like a product, because we are treating our content just like our product managers treat their products. Did you have to actually say those words to people? Did you have to say like, uh, this is not a project. This is part of the product. <laughs> no, I didn't. And I've been Very thinking lucky. about this. <laughs> so, if, so here's the thing. This is our rallying cry within the, the content yeah. team. The content team thinks about the content as a product. So to each other, we definitely say these words. But to external folks, they were already used to us talking about the user. So mm -hmm. really, we just had to talk about benefits to the user. If we do these things, you're going to see these benefits. We're going to drive down support tickets. And, and because we were using the language, I think, that they were already used to, it, it made it fairly successful in, in getting people to, to 
think about our content like a product and not that thing we do at the end. Yeah, I think that's interesting. And you know what? I, I have been a proponent, and I'm certain that I've said this in the past at conferences where people looked at me like I was crazy. But I, I basically would make the argument that this was a product, right? It's, it's it, And then it's, it's important. But it's also important that we don't have to make everyone believe what we believe. We need to be able to, and here's where people start to get questioning about my reality. They, they think that the words that I'm using to describe this manipulative, we have to manipulate people is a negative word. And I'm like, so you have to manipulate a toddler not to run into the street so they don't get hit by a car. And sometimes that involves, you know, distraction or, you know, reward for attention, you know, candy or whatever, just to get them to pay attention to you. And you're doing it not to do something bad. You're doing it to do something good. Did you find that by talking amongst yourselves about your own jargon and that kind of stuff, but then presenting it in the form of the user to the other folks is simply a good way of communicating what you needed to, to them without having to try to convince them to like adopt your vocabulary and way of thinking. I think for the majority of uh, the writers, yeah, that's that's exactly what's happened. They've been able to uh, bring the benefits. We we go back to the data uh, if if we do have folks who are questioning why we're doing things and saying, look, we've we've actually proven that that this works. Um, so data is very important, and when we're having these conversations, um, I think when we have new folks who are joining, we do probably introduce our, our strategy and, and why we do certain things a certain way or why we put content in, mm -hmm. in certain uh, places uh, versus where they might be suggesting it. And, and that's really no fault of the product manager. They're coming from a different place as well. Sure. And I think it's, it gives us that common language um, without trying to like really hammer, like this is content is our product. Sure. Uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't really resonate. Uh, our strategy doesn't resonate when we just say it that way. Right. What resonates is we're going to make your users successful. Right. What I hear you saying is if you speak to the, the people you need to influence in a way that they understand, it might be easier than trying to convert them into the you know, what we would talk about as the best practice language that we're going to use amongst one another. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of, if you think about it, it's just akin to educating a customer like your customer doesn't need to know who created the content or why you can't download this thing right you know, <laughs> that, that's the marketing department nobody needs to know any of that and we don't say that we say oh you know we're working on it behind the scenes and we'll try to get you a better information experience and then we have to go back into the company and explain to all these other people why customers need something so i really like your idea of focusing on talking about the user have you had success in helping coworkers to stop thinking of content as a project when people slip into that mode and how how did you work to do that uh yeah i, I think we have it depends on who we're working with uh, i think within uh product and product managers because they're the folks that we work with the most um and because we're speaking their language we we didn't really run into too many challenges there uh, but as we've talked to other uh organizations within within Cloudflare who might be asking for content. Uh, those folks are ones that think about things more as like a project where you submit a request and then we take care of it and then you're done. You just you, you just move on. And so that's been an education. Uh, this is actually where we do some project management work, where if we do have uh, a request and it does seem more like a project, we do treat it like a project where um, we set uh, like a, a deadline. We set up our JIRA tickets. We have our deadline for when we want it done. Uh, but where we bring in the product part is we say, how do we know we're going to be successful with this? And and we try to make sure that there's a measurement measurement piece to these projects uh, so that we're just not in taking requests that don't make sense for uh, the content that we create. Interesting. Let's let's um, take a brief pause to address a couple of um, words that we've used on the show that our viewers are curious about. So one of them is, could you define the roles and responsibilities of content designer? What do you think content designers are at your company? So content designers are focused on in-product content. Um, so think about the narratives, the workflows for features uh, that are actually within the Cloudflare product itself. 
Um, that does include error messaging. Uh, it can also include CTAs. Uh, we have some help content uh, as well. Uh, and, and really it's working again with design and product in order to figure out what the goals of the future are. So that's how we're setting up uh, content designers. I think it's pretty well aligned with what a UX content designer would be if we had a UX team, um, but, but we, we are not set up that way. So you're not formally dividing them into specific roles, but you are taking all the, the tasks that they do, both of those, and bringing them together under one umbrella. So one of our viewers wants to know, so what would a tech writer need to do at your organization in order to become a content designer? And I think that maybe what you need to do might be what needs to change? What, what right. do I do if I wanted to move from tech comm to a content, content design? design is it the same thing is probably a question, fair question as well. So I don't think it's the same thing. Um, I Technical writers, I mean, I was a technical writer. I would not consider myself uh, a content designer because I was I was writing technical content. I was, I was writing spec docs. Uh, that's a very different type of content than yeah. uh, what would go in the actual UI. Um, so I do consider it different and that's why we identified that we needed to, to build uh, up this team. For folks who are technical writers who would want to become content design, um, I think that's where our development plans come into play. So if you are a technical writer and um, you identify that with, with me as a goal that you want to set for the year, uh, then we would find opportunities to work on content design, to learn more about those, those strategies, to help support those, um, those tasks, to see if that's really what you, what you like uh, to do. And um, if you don't, then you can go back to, to being a technical writer and, and that's fantastic. That's pretty much how I grow careers is, is that we find opportunities to see if it's a right fit and then we just keep growing from there, uh, especially if the business can support it. Uh, we can't do this for, for everything. Um, sure. Sometimes there's just no business need, but, but we do have a business need uh, for, for content design right now. And do you have a particular expert or resource that you rely on to help people understand content design so that you're not constantly the education source? <laughs> I hired a very smart person who has a background in UX and content design. Um, and uh, I, I really hired for my gap because I, I know that my, my background is and my strength is, is really in technical content. Uh, not to say I, I haven't had a uh, uh, experience with, with content design. I just knew that um, we could do better by bringing in uh, an expert. So I've got a fantastic person on my team who, who uh, helps drive that vision. Excellent. One of our viewers said that uh, as my role as a senior technical editor includes content design, I work with UX design to provide UI content. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think, I mean, I think it's interesting how many, you know, variations on a theme you can get when you start talking about roles and responsibilities related to tech comp. But I guess that it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't matter what you're called so much as what it is that you do. And do you have the resources that you need and the experience and training and knowledge and support to, to do what the company needs? It's really less important about whether they call you content designer. It's I, I go back and forth on that um, yeah. because titles matter. Uh, folks uh, feel recognized when they have the right titles. And so if if you are called a, a UX writer or UX editor and that doesn't feel like it, it uh, matches the work that you're doing, I can understand why why you might want a different title or you're looking for that. But I'll agree with you, Scott, that at the end of the day, for me, it kind of all is is. Uh, very similar. Um, I've I have read about the differences. I I am just at not at a mature state to be able to bring on. Here's my UX writer. Here's my content designer. We yeah. are kind of thinking of the 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 folks who are working with the UI and the product. They're content designers. When maybe I we'll, maybe we'll mature and and break I, that out at one point. <laughs> if that's I'm sure you will actually. Uh, when I was interviewing Sarah Richards, who wrote the book on content design, one of the first things she told me was aside from, I don't want to be the queen of content design, please stop attributing <laughs> everything to me, because she had a very specific intent when she was trying to communicate why design needs to be research oriented. And her, her default answer seemed to be, we start with the research, then we decide how to make a solution. We don't come in with beliefs 
and feelings and then design like an artist would because she said, I'm not designing a project to reward myself as an artist. I feel good expressing myself. It's nice if you're designing for me and you express yourself and you feel good, <laughs> but I'm asking you to use your talents, which might include art and design, to design a specification, something to solve a specific problem. And we want to start with research so that we have some backing behind our efforts. Otherwise, you design it and then you figure out, oh, that's not what they need. Right. Um, that's happened to all of us, right? I've written stuff. I, I, I went into a gig uh, once where there was this big binder full, like a huge binder full of stuff, stuffed over filling post-it notes stuffing out everywhere popping out and in the first recommendation i made without knowing enough because i was young and i thought i knew everything i said oh well the very first thing we should do is digitize that and the manager looked at me and she said i've got somebody who agrees with you and i have a couple people who disagree who disagrees and somebody raised their hand and she said why and she said scott didn't even ask us how often do you use that? <laughs> and so I said, well, how often do you use it? And they said, would you want to digitize that whole thing if you were prioritizing the things we could do? If you knew that we only use that book on December 31st, we never use it on any other day. And I'm like, what? And they're like, it's accounting stuff. And it's the end of the year. <laughs> and the, the deadline occurs at midnight when the year changes. Anything that doesn't get done at, you know, before that is not done. So we use this book at the very end. It's like a life-saving thing. We flip through and say, what happens if you have this weird situation? And, you know, <laughs> but we're only going to use it at that very moment. If you were going to fix something that we use, could you fix something we use every day? Maybe something that we use those other 364 days of the year because it'll give more bang for your you know, solution buck, if you will. Do you find that having the data empowers you to make those prioritizations that we might have had a guess at in the past? Definitely. Um, having data, and I'll say this for both content design and uh, the, the technical documentation that we create for Lake DevDocs, uh, we, have, we have data for both. It's really helped as the team has grown. So when you have a small team and you have lots of folks who have lots of different requests, you kind of have to figure out what your priorities are, are because we can't do everything. And if we try to do everything, we're probably not going to do a great job. So um, we, we shouldn't try to do everything. And so going back to like, what are the top priorities um, usually come down to like what content is being visited? Where are we seeing a lot of uh, support tickets uh, being submitted or in the community? Is there a lot of chatter about folks who are, are struggling? And that's kind of helped us prioritize things like onboarding or some of our products, SSL and DNS, which um, those, those are things that everyone uses. And so that allows us to make sure that we're focusing in on the right things and, and maybe not some of the uh, products that are more niche at, at the moment. Not to say that we won't get to it. It's just not at the top. Speaking of the right things, it seems like building relationships and being perceived as trustworthy and capable is super important if you're going to go ask someone in a leadership role to give you support. How, what advice, what have you, what lessons have you learned and what advice might you be able to share with people who want to talk to leadership about supporting their initiatives to do better content work? So you know, how I, do you go in there and, and, and make your case? Um, I, so when I started and, and we wanted to build the team, um, I really started with what our company goals were. Uh, we, we had a like what, what the Cloudflare goals were. And then we had product goals. And I, I kind of laddered up the things that we were doing uh, within the organization, the, the content organization, laddered them up uh, to the, org, the, the Cloudflare org uh, so that we could see how our, our KPIs, our OKRs, uh, any of our goals were actually making an impact at that high level. And um, I think that helped show that, again, content is, is part of not just part of the product, but it is a product where we're setting our own KPIs and goals. And it is uh, going back to having the same language as, as product, we're, we're using the same language to, to show how we're going to make an impact uh, for the, the organization for product and then uh, users if, if they need support and things like that. How, 
how how did you start to develop relationships when you first joined the company and you did, don't have these existing relationships? So I joined during the pandemic, which is probably a very different experience than if I had joined when uh, we were in person. Um, and I think I set up 50 one-on-ones in a couple of weeks uh, just to, to talk to people, see what they were working on, uh, build relationships, and uh, just just get my face out there so, so folks knew who I was. Uh, that, that was a, a big part of, of just getting to know people, especially in, in a work from home pandemic situation. And, and we're a global uh, company. So that's, we, I would have probably done that no matter what. And what I've done af- since then, because uh, we've had enormous growth over the past uh, couple of years, is every month uh, I try to make sure I set up maybe one or two one-on-ones uh, with, with folks around the team or the, the organization so that uh, I can continue to meet new people and I don't just stop and, and focus in on uh, the folks I know or the folks who are reaching out to me, but that I continue reaching out. It's important to show that your company, um, that, that the team members that you manage value treating content like an asset and that there's some benefits to doing so. What might you suggest for audience members to show the impact over time? So it's different than going and asking a leader, hey, can you give me authority to try to change things? I need a little bit of help. What do we do to, to show them the impact over time so that they continue to support the efforts and they don't forget about our little project when they start <laughs> meandering about you know, trying to solve other problems? So in the beginning, it was it was mostly me reaching out to folks and and uh, putting my face out there and, and making sure that uh, folks knew who I was. But as the team grows, uh, we have to make sure that they're visible as well. So uh, some of them do presentations. Um, I think building those relationships with the product managers uh, that's a big thing. And uh, as an example, I, I, I was thinking about this as, as like a, a real win and um, where we've built off of momentum is uh, like technical writers when they're working with product managers and they're really excited about the new content. And we have this uh, way where uh, the product managers actually send out emails saying, hey, these are the new features and products. And we had a new content uh, space that, that went live and the product manager sent an email to that group saying, hey, we've got new content. So they actually are announcing how great this content is uh, to uh, the organization, just like you would with with products. And so that momentum of uh, someone being excited about content, and we have great stakeholder support where they are talking about what we're doing, kind of gets us noticed and uh, recognized uh, pretty pretty often, which is, which is really powerful. And keeping us relevant and, and uh, yeah, mostly keeping us relevant. <laughs> no, I think that's perfect. Perfect. And it's kind of like borrowing from PR. If you think about it, we've got our personal brands. We have our team's personal brand, right? It's a, the team brand, if you will. Um, like you want people in the company to kind of understand what it is that you're doing. They don't need to know the minutia, right? They don't no. need to know anything about XML or JSON or some tool that we use, but instead they need to know the capabilities that we're bringing to the organization. So how capable is Cloudflare at doing the things that you want them to do? And do, do you feel like as a leader that you're on the right trajectory? Oh, I, I mean, I feel, uh, very supported in that the vision that we have for content is is embraced by by the product. Um, I'll admit that I'm very lucky working at Cloudflare because we love content. Um, before I even got there, we loved content. And uh, if you've ever looked at our blog, uh, there's there's lots of folks uh, from from our uh, CEO Matthew uh, all the way down to to folks who are just joining who are creating blogs. So content creation was already part of Cloudflare um, before I got there. And then I think it was just, how do we do this better? How do we support folks? How do we f- support users so that they can be successful? And so I, I'm lucky in that we had that stakeholder support even before we got there. So I feel like we're on the right, the right path and that I am um, wholly supported in, in what we're trying to do. Excellent. And our last question before we take some more questions from the audience. So as a reminder, audience members, if you join the show a little bit late, you can use the ask a question button located underneath your webinar viewing panel to um, 
click into a little text window that will allow you to submit a question to Kim and myself should you desire to do so. And here's one for you. You use the words Agilistas, and I noticed that too and wrote it down. <laughs> uh, what did you mean by that? And, uh, and, and, and why is that even a word? <laughs> so when uh when i was learning uh, uh about uh scrum and yeah. uh, scrum planning uh, agilistas are the the folks who uphold uh, agile methodologies and, and the ceremonies and and teach other folks about agile um i think lots of different organizations have the agilistas who who are are the folks who are making sure that agile is is happening um i was not an agilista but uh I had friends who were. <laughs> yes, yes. I know some Agilistas. And actually, when I took the Scrum Master training, which I, I did to, to get the certification just to kind of, I didn't want to be a Scrum Master. I wanted to know why people were talking about using Scrum in a technical communication landscape. And what I quickly learned was that the people teaching the class were teaching the methodology. They have no idea what you're going to go do with it. <laughs> if they've had previous experience and some of them came from development, right? Or product. And they were less concerned about the content timelines and the things that didn't jive. And most much of my questions were about how do we meld those two together? And then how do we develop the exceptions to the rules that you don't want to have as an agilista because you want to follow the methodology as a true methodology. But it turns out that there's different flavors of that methodology. And some companies imp implement agile as like, we kind of sort of agile and <laughs> other companies say we borrowed the three things that were most relevant for us and we skipped the other stuff. What do you feel is the value of that, those approaches and which one do you, you know, favor? So I think when we started, we were probably, more of the the pure agile methodology because um because i i had been a scrum or a product owner just before so sure. uh that that felt most relevant to me and I, I needed a process to to be able to intake uh information and figure out priority over time that has proven to be a bit too rigid uh for for how we develop products so we've actually more uh switched to taking the like how the product development process is, uh, we, we follow more along those lines rather than our own, um, our own process, just because they don't, they don't necessarily align. The things that we have kept though, are uh, daily standup. Well, okay, not every day because we don't need to meet every, every single day as, as a content team for, for standup, uh, but we do sprint planning. Um, we do retrospectives um, and uh, those are the main ceremonies that, that we've kept. But the way we're actually set up is the writers are more like product managers for their, their product and their content space. So that's where we've had to really adjust because we don't have one single product owner. I'm not like the chief product owner of, of content where I have to approve all of the priorities. The, the writers work with their product managers to identify those priorities and then they bring them to sprint plan planning uh, to, to plan out their, their sprints. So we've had to adjust it. So I think that gives the answer where we've chosen the top three things that are most important to us so that we can be efficient and effective at, at getting things out the door. Thank you for that. When when you Google Cloudflare languages, which I did while you were chatting there for a second, you get a bunch of stuff about the languages that you support, which in this particular terminology means things like C and C++ language or WebAssembly language. But what about spoken languages by human beings? What languages are you supporting? So right now, developer docs is just English. Um, we will, uh, we have it on our roadmap for later this year where we will be uh, supporting additional languages. Um, so we are moving in that direction, but going back to it's, it's been a year, we've had to clean up a lot of things. We've had to create a lot of things. And now we're like, now we're at that, that uh, inflection point where localization and, and um, what our users are looking for is, is something that we need to prioritize. So that's coming. Excellent. Because the, the last two questions that were submitted were localization related. One of them is just basically asking, um, are you considering bringing the localization team in during the content design process? What's your thought on what you might do? So 
what I would like to do. We're working with the, the PMO. Um, we have a, a product management office that is supporting our localization efforts. So mm -hmm. um, we'll be working with them. Uh, we do have a tool because we do localize uh, our dashboard, the Cloudflare dashboard. And so we'll be using that as well. And one of the things that is really important to me as we move into localization and, and figuring out what that process is, is how do we automate it as much as we can? So we're in GitHub. Uh, we can do the plugins and, and connections that we need to with, with the translation tool. How can we do this so that we actually can, can make this efficient and effective and, and not real cumbersome? Because I've been part of some, some cumbersome uh, processes and it, it doesn't have to be. And meaning we're at the beginning, I think we can do it right whatever right might look like. <laughs> One of our viewers asked, could you provide some recommendations on how you might appro approach this following thing? The best way to evaluate localization and translation opportunities for the content that you have. How would you start thinking about it before you even did it? So <clears throat> I think what we've already done is to figure out what the languages are. We went back to see where our users are coming from. And we actually went to the Cloudflare dashboard to see who's using the dashboard, not who's mm -hmm. approaching the content. Because we're not going to see who's approaching the content in the way that we really need that data. So we've done that to, to narrow down what are the, the top five languages that we should prioritize first. Then we talk to our development and engineering folks to say, so we want to build this and we want it to, to sit within our open source community, uh, GitHub. And these are the, the automation things that we need. And I think that's where we are right now is having that conversation. How do we, what, what's the highest priority? What do we need to build? What's going to take a long time? And, and so that's where we are. I don't know if that's answering the question. No, it, it is, I guess, because I, you know, know more than I need to know about this subject. I, <laughs> as a guest, I should just be curious and ask you questions, but because I know it's also challenging to manage terminology. Is that oh. something that's in the mix there? Because if you, if not, we end up with these projects and then different people come to the stage using different words and the translators just want to translate or the machine, either one people or machines. But the context is really important. So how do we unify these vocabularies? And if, if you haven't done that yet, is that something that's probably on the radar screen? So we are, and so we have a, a shared like uh, language library that mm -hmm. we use uh, for both the technical uh, writers and the in-product uh, content. So the content designers, we have that that shared uh, word, word choice. And, and as we're going through things, we are identifying, does it translate well um, or, or not well. Um, and we're trying to figure out how do we actually uh, make this as, as part of our automated um, processes so that it does a language check. So I don't have a taxonomist on the team. Uh, I think a taxonomist would, would be pretty amazing uh, to have. I've worked with taxonomists that have helped really streamline the words that you use. Um, but I would say that it's something that we're all thinking about. And until we actually get into some of the, the translation uh, aspects of, of rolling it out, I think that's when we're going to find that maybe we need to, uh, we have some gaps, if you will. So probably but, next yeah. year, Scott, is yeah. when we'll be <laughs> really focusing I, I, you're on not, You're not alone. <laughs> but I think, I think you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned taxonomy first, because it's really about the metadata. Yeah. And a lot of people skip this step because they think that the writing itself is the content, but it's really the content about the content that right. <laughs> gets your right. content to the right person at the right time. Right. Um, right. Isn't that a struggle to communicate sometimes that it's not just that we produce the right content, we put it on a web page, but we actually have to do other stuff to it. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I don't like there's, we, we put the metadata in, in place. Uh, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll take a step back and, and we yeah. actually did like alt text. I think alt text was a project that we were inconsistent with. Mm -hmm. um, we did it sometimes, but not all the time. And so that was actually a project that we led not long ago to put alt text in place because it's- and Was that to get like a consistency between the different people who were choosing to add alt text? So let's get everybody to choose to do it and then let's do it in a similar way. Right, and so that's exactly what it was, and also to make sure that we were we were doing it, um, and that we hadn't skipped over some things, uh, or or images. So we we treated this like a project, and we gave ourselves like three four months to go through and and uh, apply the alt text, and we had some some general guidelines. This I think is one of those things where. Um, we did it because it's the right thing to do. Right. I prioritized it. Um, I didn't have to actually go and say to anyone, 
this is important, we need to do this. Um, so I, I have that ability to make those, those decisions. And, um, but if you had to actually say, hey, this is important, it's not really seen by a lot of, of folks, but screen readers do need this information. We need to support that community. Um, it's, it's a difficult conversation because it's not seen, if you will. It's not like in your face, just like the metadata and stuff like right, that. Right, right. So I guess the, a different situation might be more noticeable is what you're getting at. And so then it might be more evident why yes. we wanted to do something. For example, what about mergers and acquisitions? It seems like that's a disruptive event that would help you to illustrate why content is important. It is, and we've had a couple of, of mergers and acquisitions and um, adding that content to our uh, developer docs has is something that we end up prioritizing. And, and we prioritize it because one, you have a whole company that is becoming part of Cloudflare. And so there's a user base. We wanna make sure that they have a good experience coming over to Cloudflare because um, it could go back to, to brand, but also it's just the right thing to do uh, to, to be able to support these, these folks. Um, and when that content's not there, I mean, I could think back to companies that I've worked with, um, but just as a, as a user, and if they're acquired, and I can't find information about them on the new site, I feel like I'm just not valued. So we want to make sure that folks are valued. Uh, the other thing is, is it's a it's new. So when our support team needs to uh, field calls from folks who are coming in saying, hey, we're having a, a problem with this, having good docs is a, is a good transition. So it, it helps everyone internally, externally, if you're an existing customer or considering um, like actually using the product uh, because you, you saw an announcement or something like that, that the, the investment from docs shows like Cloudflare is, is on board and, and is investing their, their time and experience around that merger and acquisition. Excellent. I mean, br bringing new, new information and in created by different people in a different company has got to be loaded with all kinds of challenges yeah. because you've set up a system that helps you manage your existing content. Is it easier to at least transform the, the transformation is the problem, right? You have to transform the existing content that you acquired and somehow make it fit into your system. But by having a system, you have something that you can actually aim at. Is that easier than like the free for all approach that used to be like, how do we smash these two together? <laughs> I think so. Um, <laughs> part of what we talk about is we don't want someone to come into content and feel like that content was wrote by a specific person and it's a product that feels standalone from the rest of the other products that, that Cloudflare offers. And we have a lot of products. So we want to make sure that it feels like it's all part of the same, uh, the same company, and and that really resonates, you know, as part of an acquisition or merger. Uh, folks want to be embraced by the company, so so that language is is helpful to use when when we're working with new folks for sure. Um, there might be a little resistance. Uh, it kind of depends on if you feel really connected to the content that you created or not. This is where data helps. You go back to the data to show this is where we've been successful with uh, our content creation in the past. Um, and this is why we do those things. And then we kind of, you know, work back and forth. We're not gonna, uh, it's, it's really, again, going back and trying to create good relationships, but also making sure that we're staying true to creating consistent content across all of our sites. I think the final question I have for you is, how important is it for us to maintain metrics and, and pay attention to the effort that's required to bring in content from an external source during a merger or an acquisition so that, for example, the next acquisition or merger includes in the project plan sufficient time for the content to actually be transformed in such a way that it would sound like it came from the same company. You know, I, I think as as I've worked through acquisitions and mergers, not, not just at Cloudflare, but for other uh, companies, it's incredibly important because it is it is a pretty big lift uh, to transform the content and, and bring it into the new experience. Um, I, when I was working on more of the marketing content, uh, bringing in uh, websites into the existing website is, is always a large effort as well. And, and sometimes that isn't taken into consideration uh, when when those plans are being put together. So 
being able to communicate, it's going to take X amount of time and, and this many writers uh, really helps make sure that we're prioritizing appropriately. Also, you can talk about what won't get done because of those things. And I think that's really helpful as well, um, where it's like, yeah, we can make this happen, uh, but what you've been receiving uh, from us as a, as a team, it might have to, to be reduced in, in certain uh, spaces so that we can still do a quality job, uh, but not feel like you know we're trying to, to take on everything all at the same time. Um, at the last minute, we got a, a question while you were talking there. I think you can answer. It says, how many writers are on your team and what's the writer to developer ratio? I do not know the writer to developer ratio, but I can say that the writer to product ratio is ah. about, yeah, uh, so it's usually about three to four active products. Um, and then we have probably two to three, I, I, they're not inactive products, but they're products that don't need a lot of content. So it might be something they're just asking for something every do, four to six months, something like that. Do you look at writer to product ratio in a, in, because looking at writer to engineering resource ratio, isn't that meaningful? Or I mean, like, what, what were you thinking when you matched up? Like, oh, we can't have people working on too many products, obviously. But right. what about that ratio? So we, I chose that ratio because we work closely, we're in product and we work closely with product managers. And then how the teams are set ah. up, you have the product managers, then you have the engineers who support uh, mm -hmm. the, the product. So to map it to the actual like engineering department, would would be some advanced math um, where if I just do the product manager, <laughs> it's a whole lot easier just to add and and we can we can keep it a whole lot simpler uh, when when we're trying to figure that out. Excellent. Well, thank you. I think we're just just about out of time, so I wanted to uh, thank you for making time to share your lessons learned and things that you found to be interesting about product content. I agree with you. It's definitely uh, impacts sales and. Uh, is part of the product. So we definitely want to keep people moving down that momentum. Thanks for sharing what you've learned. It's super appreciated. And also thank you to our sponsor today, Zoom in Software. I wanted to let you know that Zoom in provides a great tool that allows you, it's a platform actually, that allows you to bring all your technical content together. That would be your unstructured content, structured content, and other kind of content assets, and present them in a unified way and maybe a knowledge center or a support center that your customers and prospective customers can use to answer a lot of the questions that they have about your products in advance. You can learn more about Zoom in Software at zoominsoftware.com. There's also some information available in the attachments section of your webinar viewing panel, including some uh, case study information provided by Zoom in the company itself. Also, I wanted to let you know that coming up in our future show on the Content Advantage, June 14th, I'll be speaking with Sarah Johnson of CVS Health. She's going to help us understand her eight-step to content first design approach and um, talk about what's required to get started if you'd like to mimic that approach. We also have June 28th, our friend Keith Chignelli Roberts, who's going to come and talk about his experiences at AMD and previous jobs. Um, hiring and retaining technical writers, how to find and keep them, which has definitely been a challenge in the uh, pandemic world in which we've been living the last few years. So you've been watching Technical Content is the Product with Kim Jeske. I'd love for you to give us a rating on the way out the door using the Rate This tab located underneath your webinar viewing panel. Clicking that button will open a five-star rating system. Five is the high rating and one is low. There's also a field into which you can type some information We'd like you to evaluate the quality of the conversation today and let us know if you've got any ideas for upcoming shows that we might do in the future. We'd love to hear from you. Until then, I'd like to say thank you for joining us. Be safe, be well, keep doing great work, and we'll see you again at an additional um, upcoming edition of the Content Advantage. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, Scott. Have a great day, everybody.